what i'm going to be discussing in the next 25 minutes or so is the current situation of covid-19 in india uh, the vaccine what are the principles and evidence as far as vaccine is concerned because when we talk of beyond the booster it's important to understand the basic philosophy behind vaccine how where we are as far as vaccine rollout is concerned the challenges that we have and the solutions that we may be able to offer subsequently so covid-19 has resulted in the biggest pandemic of a lifetime it started off with what was reported as a severe acute respiratory syndrome caused by coronavirus 2 in wuhan china in december 2019 and in the subsequent two and a half years it has infected at least 634 million people worldwide and has caused more than 6.6 million deaths in india we've had three waves the second wave has been the devastating wave that we've seen and in terms of number of cases and number of deaths Uh, India has the second highest number of documented cases at 4.46 crores, and the sec- third highest number of deaths at 4.29 lakhs. But if you were to look at this in num- in terms of the number of cases or number of deaths per million population, India has done remarkably well as compared to even the Western world. So the number seems large because of the size of our population. But if we look at it per million population, we have had much less number of cases, and even the mortality has been less. we started off in january of 2020 when we had these first report of uh, three medical students who had come returned from china and had gone to kerala and they had actually traveled uh, through uh, multiple airports uh, came out to be positive there was a lot of contact tracing done at that point in time in march 2020 we had a lockdown and the first wave we had in uh, september of 2020 which had about 90000 cases a day we were very aggressive in launching our vaccine we had two vaccines which were launched on the 16th of january 2021 and in less than one year of having our first case and uh, almost aligned with the vaccine launch as far as the western world was concerned we had a devastating wave of, of more than 4 lakh cases a day uh, in uh, march to may of 2021 this caused a lot of mortality and then we had the omicron wave last year in december and now we have seen the end of the wave so now we've had these three waves and if you look at the current situation we're in a pretty good situation that although we are seeing new variants and it's been said that there are more than 300 variants being reported which are all sub lineages of omicron the cases are uh, still there but the mortality and and hospitalization is very very low so let's go to the principles of vaccine and what is the evidence so how do vaccines work vaccines induce an immune response of a host against a pathogen without exposing them to the disease so they cause an immune response and without cause uh, the person actually having the disease and we have had more than 60 candidate vaccines for this just one virus undergoing human trials and more than 180 preclinical trials they can work in various mechanism and i think this is important because sometimes people say that i got covid and therefore the vaccine is not working so vaccine can work in preventing infection that would be ideal that you have a vaccine which doesn't uh, which pr- pr- protects you in such a manner that you don't get the infection at all but more often they work in preventing illness that you don't get significant illness it prevents hospitalization it prevents intensive care admission and it prevents death so this seems to be the major role as far as vaccines of uh, covid is concerned that they prevent significant degree of disease you may still have a mild illness you may still be infectious and transmit the disease to other people but it can also help in preventing transmission because the number of people infected if they are less or the duration of infectivity comes down because of vaccination then the transmission chain is also broken so this is important to keep in mind as far as the action of vaccines is concerned we have a whole array of vaccines now and uh, we have the inactivated vaccine uh, the bharat biotech vaccine is a is, is an inactivated whole viron vaccine we also have live attenuated vaccine although not very popular the viral vector vaccines which are available uh, both as far as uh, covid shield is concerned the astra zeneca vaccine uses a viral vector so does the chinese vaccine uh, as far as viral vector is concerned then we have the nucleic acid vaccines the mrna vaccine and the dna vaccine which is from india the dna plasmid vaccine and then we have the protein based vaccine the protein subunit or the vlp the virus like particle vaccine so what does all of this mean so when you look at the weakened virus and this is basically uh, the codenics uh, by the serum institute of india which is basically a virus it is 
uh, in, inactivated, uh, it is a live attenuated vaccine which is used, uh, which is a virus which is used as a vaccine. And then we have the inactivated virus, which is basically a vaccine which are rendered non-infectious using chemicals such as formaldehyde, and they are then made inactive, uh, inactivated like Covaxin or Sinovac. The nucleic acid vaccines are the one which created a lot of excitement because it was felt that they could be easily changed, quickly modified in case we had a new variant coming and they were easy to manufacture. And this was the, the first time that these came into the market and uh, uh, were allowed for human use. And this, in this vaccine, the nucleic acid is inserted into the human cell and this produces copies of the virus protein. Most of these vaccines actually look at the spike protein and can be an RNA and DNA based vaccine and very quickly the RNA and DNA based vaccine disintegrates and does not really uh, get involved into the genetic makeup of individual. The RNA vaccine we all know are by Pfizer and Moderna and the DNA vaccine is the COVAX-D which is a DNA plasmid vaccine by Zydus Cadillac. Then we have the non-replicating uh, viral vector vaccines, which are the Covishield, which uses an adenovirus. Covishield uses a, chim a, ch a chimpanzee adenovirus. It's a non-human adenovirus, which is the viral vector. The other uh, Sputnik uses a human adenovirus uh, vector as far as uh, the vector is concerned. And we have the replicating viral vector vaccines also, which is uh, uh, like the uh, weakened measles vaccine. Protein subunit vaccines came later on, and these were the VLP, the virus-like particle, or the protein uh, subunit vaccines, which are protein subunits, which are basically at the virus spike protein. And this is the key part uh, of it, which is at the receptor binding domain. And these virus, these vaccines uh, may require an adjuvant to really stimulate the immune system. And no uh, vax or even Cobrivax, which is now available in our country, is a protein subunit vaccine. Uh, again, the advantage is that one can rapidly produce uh, large quantities of this vaccine um, at a very low cost. So we have been, vaccines have undergone a number of clinical trials and the whole issue comes up and this is something which will always be there that when we come with new vaccines, should they undergo all of these uh, new trials, especially when you're looking at uh, sub beyond the booster dose and with new vaccines. So we have preclinical trials, phase one trial, phase two and phase three trial. Preclinical, pre preclinical, we all know, are basically on animals and pre primates. Uh, phase one are on healthy volunteers, which are basically looking at dose ranging and safety, immunogenicity, and then phase two and phase three sometimes are combined, basically to look at immunogenicity, safety, and look at a real life situation. What we've been able to do in the last uh, during the pandemic was we've been able to compress all of this and work in sequence rather than parallel. It would take us almost ten years to get a vaccine because the fact that it went, underwent various stages. Uh, you had a first uh, preclinical trials and then you took a decision whether this vaccine was worth taking forward. You had the first human trials, efficacious trials in humans and evaluation trials. All of this was compressed with a lot of investment being done and risks being taken so that once you had a target vaccine, it went into clinical trials and production also started simultaneously while the trials were being done scaling up was being done as far as manufacturing is concerned and very quickly approvals could be given and vaccines could be manufactured. Because of this, we were able to have a, a large number of vaccines within one year. Now with this data, which we already have in terms of the preclinical phase one and phase two trial, it would be easy to move ahead in terms of new vaccines beyond the booster uh, if we are looking at that because the basis of the safety and efficacy is already established as far as this is concerned. And we do this for the influenza virus. We every year have an influenza vaccine, which is basically a new vaccine. But at the same time, these uh, phase one, phase two, and phase three studies are not really required because the basic uh, safety and efficacy and immunogenicity studies have already been done. Now, the great question that comes up is what should be a vaccine efficacy? Uh, for a COVID-19 vaccine to be licensed. And we all know that vaccine efficacy is equal to the attack rate in unvaccinated minus the attack rate in vaccinated divided by the attack rate in unvaccinated and into multiplied by 100. Now, each of the trials, and that is where the tricky part comes, each trials had a pre-specified number of detected cases for which efficacy was to be assessed. And this led to the calculation of the sample size and how many individuals were required. 
the US FDA and WHO has provided some degree of uh, guidelines in terms of minimal efficacy and efficacy should be at least 50% and lower bound of the confidence interval should be at least equal to more than 30%. However, it's also important that studies should assess severe COVID-19 as an additional endpoint. And this is also something that we should keep in mind. Because if you remember, like I said, we're all looking at efficacy through multiple parameters, infection, severity of illness, mortality, and transmission. So this is something that we need to keep in mind as we move ahead. If you look at the initial data, most of the data which came out of the first few vaccines showed that the, 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 the protection that they were giving was up to the tune of 94% to 66%. And all of them required more, uh, usually required more than one dose. So this was something that uh, we need to keep in mind in terms of the efficacy, but this has waned over a period of time. Just briefly touching on COVID-19 vaccines rollout in India, because I think this is something which is remarkable and something which will help us if, if, as we move forward uh, in the vaccine program, if we need to give doses which is beyond the booster dose. So in April of 2020, there was formation of the National Expert Group of Vaccine Administration, the NEGVAC. We were all involved in this. We really had multiple meetings and states were asked to set up state level me uh, mechanism for vaccine program, including cold chain. Remember, if you have to give so many vaccines in adults, you have to be able to maintain a good cold chain. Otherwise, the efficacy of the vaccine will not be there. In November of 2020, the COVID Suraksha mission was launched with rupees 900 crore being given to DBT for development of COVID vaccine. A large amount of money was given in the budget and we had uh, both Covaxin and Covishield launched in January of 2021. And I think now we have a large number of vaccines. The issue really is that are they effective now with new variants coming in? We have Covishield, Covaxin, Sputnik, Johnson & Johnson's vaccine, uh, Zycovid, and Cobravax has also been approved. So all of these vaccines are available in our country, and most of the data suggests that they are still effective in terms of severe disease, and I'll just come to that. Uh, Cobravax is the latest vaccine to be added. This is a protein subunit vaccine, contains a version of the receptor binding domain of SARS-CoV-2, a spike protein, and this also has an adjuvant. This was initially uh, developed by Texas Children's Hospital and Baylor College, and then were licensed to Biologically, which was an Indian company. And this is a very cost-effective vaccine, has also been now approved and deployed in children. There's also data which has come up, uh, although not published that much, which suggests that if we were to give uh, a, a heterologous vaccine, that if you took your previous Covaxin or Covishield and subsequently took uh, the booster dose with Cobrivax, the immune system was better stimulated as compared to taking the same homologous vaccine as a booster dose. If you look at the current data, over 2.19 billion doses of the vaccine have been administered in India, and 70% of our population is fully vaccinated, and we have surplus doses as far as the vaccine is concerned, and currently we are actually not facing a shortage of vaccine. Uh, there is a huge concern about the vaccine actually um, the date ex expiring and we're not, we're not having to destroy some degree of vaccination because we've been able to produce more vaccines than what we need. There have been a lot of efficacy data. This was the initial study which looked at the safety and efficacy of the, um, the AstraZeneca vaccine, which was uh, Covishield, uh, looking at uh, Brazil, South Africa, and UK. And this actually showed an overall efficacy of 70% with two doses 28 days uh, apart. And there were cases of transverse mellitus also reported while the study was done, but the overall efficacy was good uh, up, up to 70%. Similarly, when we looked at uh, the uh, uh, inactivated SARS-CoV vaccine, which is co um, Covaxin, uh, the efficacy was 77% as far as uh, the Indian Bharat Biotech vaccine was concerned. And this was also highly effective against laboratory confirmed symptomatic COVID-19 patients. This is a study that we had done, which was uh, done by us during the Delta wave, which we looked at the effectiveness of this uh, whole Viron vaccine, the, the Bharat Biotech vaccine, it was a test negative case control study. And here again, we were able to show that the vaccine was effective uh, if, was, if two doses were taken. Um, and the efficacy for symptomatic COVID-19 was up to 50%. And this helped in uh, confidence building as far as the rollout of the vaccine was concerned. We subsequently did another study where we looked at uh, reinfection rate and estimated efficacy, and this was done subsequently. 
uh, where we tried to look at the efficacy uh, of individual of healthcare workers who had taken co vaccine and a protection associated of 86% against reinfection was observed among healthcare workers who completed the two doses of the scheduled um, co vaccine uh, vaccine. We also then had the uh, INSAGOG, the Indian SARS CoV 2 Genomic Consortium, which started off with just 10 laboratories in January 2021. And now we have more than 50 laboratories which are doing genome sequencing. And this really helps us to pick up the variants. And the data is then fed into the NCDC website, where the clinical uh, factors are also looked into. And therefore, we get a clinical epidemiological uh, idea regarding how the new variants are behaving and is the new variant a, a cause of concern. This was what happened way back in 2021 when uh, the B1617 uh, lineage was reported. This was at that time called the double mutant because it had mutation at site of E484 and L452. A variant belonging to this lineage became what was known as the Delta variant, the B16172. And this was declared a variant of concern. And this caused a huge number of cases and deaths because this was highly transmissible and attack the low respiratory tract leading to viral pneumonia. So I think the importance here is that we need to have aggressive genomic surveillance in our country for new variants and combine that with clinical epidemiological data so that we're able to see how are these new variants behaving? Are they causing more severe disease? Are they behaving in a different manner? And therefore that will help us to decide a treatment and vaccine strategy for the future. So what are the challenges and solutions? So vaccine protection against SARS-CoV-2 infection does wane over time. It does protect against hospitalization and death, but also wanes somewhat, and that is something that is a cause of concern. A recent study published in JAMA in October looked at the statewide data from North Carolina, which included over 10 million adults, and it had showed the following results. And we started looking, they looked at protection against infection, against hospitalization, and against death. And they looked at a vac vaccine effectiveness at seven months and 12 months. Now this is recent and therefore this was look, discovered some of the new strains also. And what they found was that against inf infection, the efficacy fell down to almost 38 to 47%. Against hospitalization, it came down to around 60 to 65% from 86 to 90%. And against death, it came down from 90 to 93% to 70 to 75%. So waning immunity, but uh, not, uh, more significant against infection as compared to death and hospitalization. And that is something that we need to keep, keep in mind. What are the variants and why are we concerned about them? Because this is an RNA virus and we know that RNA viruses will continue to mutate. Uh, it's been estimated that SARS-CoV-2 will mutate at least twice a month. And therefore, these muta mutations usually have no impact as far as viral function is concerned. And they are only what is known as variants of interest. But we do have variants of concern, which actually are uh, behaving in a different manner. A variant of concern is a variant which have, may have developed increased transmissibility. It is causing more infections. And most of the recent variants of concern that we have picked up are causing more transmission. It may have ability to evade immunity to previous variants. And this is another thing which leads to more cases because most of the new variants are developing immune invasive uh, uh, immune evasive ability, and therefore they are infecting people who already have had vaccine or previous infection. However, the current variants of concern are not causing increased disease severity. If that does happen, then it also becomes a variant of concern. So, and the fourth factor here, which makes it a variant of concern is if the variant becomes, a mutation occurs in such a way that the RT-PCR test is not able to pick it up because of the variation that has occurred. So variants of concern are basically these four, increased transmissibility, immune escape mechanism, more severe disease and hospitalization and death, and uh, being missed by the routine RT-PCR test, which is being done. We've had these var various variants of concern. I won't go into this because we've already gone through all of this in the last few, uh, last two years, the alpha variant, the beta variant, the gamma variant, which uh, was predominantly in Japan and Brazil. And of course, the devastating Delta variant, which started off from India, but caused a huge number of uh, disease and death as far as the world is concerned. And then in, December, in November of 2021, we had Omicron. The interesting thing about Omicron is that the new sub-lineages that have come 
are all lineages of Omicron. There has been no lineages from the Delta variant or the previous variants. And Omicron seems to have become now the circulating dominant variant globally. And whatever variants that we're seeing, uh, sub-lineages are actually coming from Omicron itself, which in a way is good because this is a variant which is causing milder disease, unlike what Delta variant was doing. It was a cause of concern because there were over 30 mutations in the spike protein and therefore even without a lot of data, WHO declared it a uh, variant of concern because they had never seen so much of mutation occurring in the spike protein uh, uh, of the virus so quickly. It causes increased transmissibility and decreased susceptibility to the neutralizing antibodies. And as we have seen that new variants have emerged, but data suggests that vaccine remains effective in preventing severe disease but effectiveness in preventing symptomatic effect, uh, in, uh, infection is attenuated and we continue to see cases of COVID-19, but predominantly like a flu-like syndrome. How does the vaccine work? And this is a study which was published in March in the NEJM. And when they looked at uh, the Omicron variant and the Delta variant, what they found was that with Omicron variant, the vaccine efficacy effectiveness, even against the mRNA vaccine came down rapidly and by 25th week, it was actually very, very low. But with the booster, uh, it went up significantly uh, as far as uh, mRNA vaccine was concerned. The paper also looked at the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, Covishield. And again, if you see, as far as uh, the Omicron variant is concerned, uh, around the 25th week, the vaccine efficacy is almost 0%. But with the booster dose, it comes up significantly and is able to provide good protection against Omicron variant. And therefore, even with the sub-lineages, as far as Omicron is concerned, the booster will provide protection as of now. We can also tweak the vaccine to cover new variants. Uh, this has been a concern about uh, immunologists that the efficacy of the vaccine will wane because after all, the vaccine that are currently being provided are, are uh, the basic origin is from the Wuhan strain. And we have moved way ahead from the Wuhan strain to the alpha, beta, delta, and Omicron strain. But vaccines can be tweaked to overcome this problem. And we do this every year as far as influenza vaccine is concerned. We have the Northern Hemisphere vaccine, which is a quadrivalent vaccine, the Southern Hemisphere vaccine, which is a quadrivalent vaccine covering two influenza A and two influenza B strain. We started with the trivalent vaccine, but since uh, influenza B started becoming dominant and there were two strains rather than one strain of influenza B uh, becoming dominant uh, in, uh, uh, globally, WHO changed the guidelines and a quadrivalent vaccine has been there for the last few years. So it is possible to really tweak vaccines as we move forward to cover with to cover the circulating strain. And I think this is how things are going to be in the future. Uh, influenza mutates uh, at a faster rate than SARS-CoV-2 and therefore tweaking should be possible. For influenza, uh, the virus is isolated. The new strains are isolated, grown in culture inactivated and then the vaccine is prepared for mRNA and DNA vac virus uh, uh, vaccine. This is easier to do, to modify and therefore tweaking viral vector vaccine is also possible. So I think with the new vaccine platforms that I showed in the beginning, it is easier for us to change or tweak the vaccine than what was in there in the past. And this should be something which should be possible. And this has been done. This is a paper which has just come out uh, in October in NEGM which looked at the bivalent Omicron vaccine, which contains the booster vaccine against COVID-19. And they looked at the booster doses with bivalent. So this covered the original strain and included the BA1 spike protein uh, of, as far as the Omicron subvariant was concerned. And what they found was that when they looked at the neutralizing antibodies against the ancestral strain, that is the D614G uh, strain, they found that on day 29, with all participants, those with no previous infection and those with previous infection, the booster uh, dose gave good amount of uh, Im uh, immune response in terms of neutralizing antibody. Also, when they looked at the Omicron variants which are circulating, again, the booster dose gave a uh, good amount of neutralizing antibodies with both the RNA, RNA vaccines and therefore showing that now with the bivalent vaccine, we should be able to provide protection even against new emerging strains. And it's felt that the new vaccine that may come will be able to cover most of the lineages that we would see as far as Omicron is concerned. This actually led to the CDC now recommending that all individuals more than five years old who have completed a primary COVID-19 vaccine series 
uh, should receive a single booster dose with one of the bivalent vaccines at least two months after the last vaccine dose. So this is an FDA emergency use uh, approval for both the uh, Pfizer bivalent booster dose and Moderna bivalent booster dose. We need more data because there are also studies which suggest that currently our immune system is pretty well tuned to uh, the, uh, uh, as far as the immune response is concerned from, uh, from uh, previous infections. And like I said, COVID-19 is becoming more and more endemic. Many people are having a flu-like syndrome and they, when they do a rapid antigen test, they come out to be COVID positive. So we are also developing our own immunity due to natural infection rather than by vaccination. And that is also providing protection in terms of herd immunity and protection to the population. So what are the challenges and solutions and how do we, how can we work on this? There are, there are other issues that we need to look at beyond just the bi bivalent vaccine. And I think the first issue is to have equitable distribution, which is very, very important. Because currently what we can see is the equitable distribution is not there. Vaccine distribution is much more as far as high income countries are concerned. And this will avert cases and deaths to a much lesser amount as compared to if there was equitable distribution. And equitable global supply and addition of our, is our best best to end the pandemic. No one is safe under, unless everyone is safe. And this is something which has been said from the very beginning. And if you look at the current data, you will find that most of Africa, the coverage is less than 20 to 30 percent. That is that many countries in Africa have still vaccinated, even still not vaccinated, even 10 percent of the population. So although there are the Western world has got 80 percent plus vaccination, India has achieved around 70 percent. We have a large part of the world which is not vaccinated fully and here there is a chance that the virus here can continue to mutate, develop new lethal strains and then this can spread to other parts of the world. So I think it's important for us to really look at vaccination as a global responsibility rather than just as a national responsibility. Vaccine hesitancy, another thing which has come up and become even more now initially when it looked at COVID-19 and this is an old paper from uh, the National uh, Medical in 2021, which suggested that India, 75% uh, of people said that they would take the vaccine uh, if it was frozen, uh, proven to be safe and effective. Uh, the main reason for not taking the vaccine were concerns about its side effects and safety and lack of trust in the process. And younger people and those from low socioeconomic status were likely to be hesitant. But this has gone up significantly. And I noticed that in our, my OPD and my clinic on a daily basis, that most of the people who are at high risk, many of them have not taken the booster dose and, are, are, and have this feeling that uh, it has more side effects and currently COVID is no longer a cause of concern and therefore they don't need to take up the uh, booster dose. I think we need to address this issue also because as WHO said, vaccine hesitancy is one of the most common, um, it has become a, a common uh, worldwide uh, global threat and that is something that needs to be addressed. It's a major obstacle in achieving vaccination coverage. And we have to address this issue by really uh, making direct recommendations for vaccination, identifying concerns, educating patients, and disp uh, dispelling misconceptions about the disease and vaccine. Because still a large number of people are vulnerable and they do need to take the booster dose. Unless we do that, we can't move beyond the booster dose. The major lessons for COVID-19 is that this century is going to be a century of outbreaks and pandemics. In the last 22 years of this century, we've had SARS, we've had MERS, we've had H1N1 pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic, Zika outbreak, H5N1 bird flu outbreak. In the South, uh, we had Nipah virus outbreak. And then we have the monkeypox and the tomato flu also coming up. So we need to really prepare for outbreaks in the future. And really educate people on non-pharmaceutical non measures as they are still important, work aggressively on new vaccines and drugs and need to safeguard non-COVID or non-pandemic uh, diseases also because they also suffer a lot. During the COVID pandemic, a lot of non-COVID diseases suffered and many patients actually suffered because of limited care as far as non-COVID care was concerned. Uh, this is an article I had written way back in uh, 2018 uh, 100 years after the flu pandemic, uh, that was the 1918 pandemic, we were still vulnerable and with the current outbreaks, we needed to be um, uh, vigilant and really develop a good system for outbreak management. Unfortunately, 
I didn't really think at that point in time that we would have a pandemic uh, in the next uh, year or two. But I think this, as we move ahead, we need to keep this in mind, even in terms of for subsequent vaccine development. So to conclude, COVID-19 vaccine uh, prevents infection, hospitalization, and deaths. And current data suggests that the current vaccine also are effective to some extent, although there is immu waning immunity. Uh, and protection increases with passing time and emergence of new variants. But uh, current evidence for booster doses primarily from the mRNA vaccine, and we need to look at newer data, which is coming from various studies in our own country, looking at the newer, newer vaccine, newer uh, vaccine which covered the emerging variants. Bivalent vaccine induced antibodies against the newer variants and provide better protection. But I think there is a need for global commitment for equitable vaccine coverage worldwide vaccine efficiency. So I'll stop here. And I would be very happy to take any questions in the